Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we're talking about something that isn't really the funnest thing to talk about, but I just got done filming my miscarriage story and if you haven't seen it, I do think that it would be, you know, a good thing to watch um, to kind of understand my story and my journey with miscarriage. But I mentioned in that video that I chose to do a DNC. When I was weighing my options and trying to decide what I wanted to do after I found out about my missed miscarriage, um, I was basically given three options. So the first option was to let the babies pass naturally, let nature take its course, however long that may be, take medicine to induce the natural process um, so that it happens quicker, or do something called a DNC. I remember searching for hours on YouTube trying to find a story about a DNC. What was it? What happened from start to finish? And this is why people, I feel don't like talking about miscarriage because nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about what a DNC is. Nobody shares their experience. Whereas if you try to search for labor and delivery stories, you will find millions live vlogs of people giving birth and what you can experience from the moment you walk in the door to the moment you get home. But when you search for things like miscarriage and DNC, there's none of it. It's so hard to find. I decided that I would go ahead and make a video about what my DNC experience was like. That way, if you're trying to weigh your options and you're trying to figure out if something like a DNC is right for you, hopefully this helps. So first off, I do want to say that if you are going through a miscarriage and you are having to weigh your options, I am so sorry for your loss and my heart is with you. I, I cry with you. It's awful, you guys. I'm going through it right now and um, it's a very lonely spot to be in and nobody wants to be in this situation. So please know that I I feel your pain and, and if you need somebody to talk to, I would love to talk to you. Please feel free to DM me on Instagram or email me because it's hard. It really is. I also want to preface this by saying that I am not a doctor. I do not have any education formally on any of this. This is just my experience from a DNC. So it's going to vary from person to person, but generally I think it's going to be relatively the same. I'm also going to try to be as detailed as possible, probably to the point where it's annoyingly detailed. Okay, so from what I have read, DNCs can happen in one of three places. You can either have them done in your OBGYN or provider's office, just their normal doctor's office that you would go to for your prenatal visits. They can also happen in a surgery center or they can happen in a hospital. There's somebody that I follow here on YouTube named Elle Fowler who is going through something very similar to me, very similar timing to mine, and her DNC took place in a surgery center. So after this video, if you want to know more about what happens in a surgery center versus a hospital, which is where mine took place, then you can definitely watch her video. So my DNC took place in a hospital and I wasn't even given the option to select the other three things. I was 12 weeks along with twins and I don't know if my lack of options was because of that or if it's just simply doctor's choice, you know, where they perform the DNC. I, I didn't ask, I don't know, but I wasn't given an option. I was told it happens here at this hospital, you go at this time. I wasn't really given a whole lot of options as far as that goes. I was also told that I would be put under general anesthesia, which was terrifying to me because I had never been put under anesthesia before, you guys. It's scary. <laughs> I know that when I was younger, I had um, some dental work done and I was put on very heavy like twilight laughing gas. Um, I also had wisdom teeth pulled, but never like general anesthesia before. So that in and of itself really, really scared me. So the way it worked for me is I had a doctor's appointment the day before my DNC where my doctor kind of gave me very general information. Now this wasn't the same doctor that was going to perform my DNC. Ideally, it would be um, because your OBGYN is the surgeon that will do your DNC for you, but my doctor was not available 
in the timeline that I needed the DNC to be performed. I wanted my DNC to be done ASAP. I had already started spotting, I had already started bleeding, and I didn't want this to happen at home. I was terrified for my miscarriage to happen at home. So I went in there telling her I want this to be done like today if possible, but they ended up scheduling it the next day. But ideally that would be the same doctor that would do your surgery for you. So she gave me general information. It was her partner that did it. So they work together every day. They know each other. You know, they share the same four walls every day. Um, so she also said that her partner had more experience with DNCs, if that would make me feel any better. Um, but she gave me very general information about what to expect. And then she did say that somebody would be calling me within the next hour or so to get me pre-op information. So my DNC was scheduled for noon the very next day. I received a call very shortly after my doctor's appointment from the hospital who let me know kind of pre-op information. So they said things like what time to get at the hospital, where the hospital was, where I should park, how I should dress, um, how I should bathe the night before as far as what soaps and lotions and makeup and stuff I could or couldn't use. They also asked me a ton, probably 20 minutes worth of questions regarding um, family history, my history, if I had ever been put under anesthesia before, what kind of, you know, if I had like heart defects or, you know, all of these things. They also asked things like, do I have any loose teeth or chipped teeth? All of the things that anesthesiologists anesthesiologists would need to know in order to do their job and so it was probably like a 25 minute conversation of just here's what to expect here's what time to be at the hospital you can stop eating at this time you can stop drinking at this time I had to stop eating at midnight the night before and then I had to stop drinking liquids four hours prior to my surgery. I was also told that the liquids I could drink in between midnight and four hours before my surgery had to be clear liquids or dark coffee. Um, I don't know the significance behind that uh, because that's the complete opposite of a clear liquid, but they did also specifically say nothing red, nothing with red dye in it. I don't know if that interferes with some sort of medical equipment or anything like that. So basically I just stuck to water. Um, I didn't want to mess anything up, but I could have easily done like Sprite, apple juice, things like that. Um, but I just drank water between midnight and that would have been 8 a.m before my surgery. I was also informed that I shouldn't wear any makeup or any lotions, which is like, it killed me because it's the middle of winter, my skin is super dry, I put lotion from head to toe every single day when I get out of the shower, and I remember the morning of, I told my husband, I was like, I need to put lotion on my face, like I can't not have lotion on my face. So I did sneak some lotion on my face, but I didn't put any lotion on my body. I was told I could wear deodorant, so I did wear deodorant, and I also put dry shampoo in my hair. I didn't, there was nothing specifically said about dry shampoo so so this was the same hospital that I delivered my son at so it's just the general town hospital there was nothing specific to DNC's or pregnancy or prenatal care or anything like that this is where you know any type of surgery or hospital need there's an ER you know everything that you would ever need in a hospital that's the hospital that I went to we parked in the same structure that we parked in you know when I went and had my son um, it was a little sad because as we were walking up, you know, we had to walk through the same elevators in the same maternity center that I delivered my son at, and that was a little bit sad. Um, but I tried not to look that way. I tried not to think about it, and we walked straight into the check-in center. So because this is COVID season, um, they did check our temperature. As soon as we walked in the door, my husband was with me. He was able to come with me through most of this experience, which I'll continue to talk about. But we got our temp temperatures checked when we walked in the door, and we had to go and check into like the general like surgery center lobby. I didn't have to do that when I delivered my son. We just went straight to labor and delivery. But this time it was like a scheduled you know thing. So we went in, we checked in, and. Immediately I spoke to, 
I want to say they were like a financial payment person if I had to give them a name. They told me how much the, the surgery was going to cost and they basically informed us at that point that we had to pay for it. I found this really interesting that they did this right away. Of course the cost of a DNC is going to vary depending on what kind of insurance you carry, where you're doing the surgery at and all of that but we have a high deductible insurance plan so we had to pay quite a bit for the dnc i mean multiple thousands of dollars after that we were instructed to go ahead and check into the actual like surgery place i will say this this whole process is going to vary depending on how your hospital is set up um, but I feel like we were handed off from person to person quite a bit. I never felt lost and I never felt like I didn't know where to go. They were very good at like getting up and physically walking us to the next section or the next door or the next waiting room that we had to go in. But I did mention to my husband, I was like, I feel like we encountered probably 50 plus employees just from being handed off from like this person in this waiting room to this person in this waiting room. So from the financial general check-in place we were handed off to this other waiting room I had to go and inform them who was waiting for me who was gonna drive me home because I was being put under general anesthesia I was not allowed to drive home myself um, so they did want somebody there to drop you off and pick you up um, an emergency contact name all of that stuff and then from there we were hand delivered to another waiting room now this was the final waiting room as far as like a formal waiting room with chairs and all of that goes and every single person we encountered did a really good job of double checking my name my birth date and why I was there I will say if you're going in for a DNC make sure you mentally prepare your mind to to say why you're there um, multiple times so at this last check-in place I was given a disposable face mask um, at the time I didn't understand why you know I wore my cloth face mask that I normally wear but um, they gave me a disposable face mask and now thinking back I understand why they did that because when you go into surgery you're still wearing your mask and they want to be able to either rip it off or replace it or if it gets lost or stolen just like you wouldn't wear your shirt into surgery that you wear a hospital gown it's the same concept but I didn't quite understand why they gave me a disposable mask at that point so this final waiting room my husband and I sat in for probably we didn't wait very long in any waiting room for, for very long at all, you know, maybe five, ten minutes. So this time it was probably ten, maybe fifteen minutes we sat and waited for a nurse. So as we were sitting there, there was a couple of other couples of people in the waiting room with us. One by one, everyone got called back. The person and the the... The patient and their support person were able to walk back together with the nurse and we are the last ones waiting in the waiting room. And I did have to get to the hospital two hours before my surgery. It was actually two and a half hours before my surgery. So at this point, like, there was still multiple hours <laughs> ahead or, you know, at least an hour and a half before my surgery. So I wasn't worried about running out of time. But I did notice, like, okay, we've been here for, like, a good 15 minutes. And then our nurse walked up and she said, are you Melissa? Are you, you know? And I was like, yes. She was like, okay, here's, who's here with you? And I was like, my husband, Matthew. And then she walked us both back to my formal pre-op room. So I'm assuming this area of the hospital was surgery pre-op. And there was a lot of people there, but every person got their own room. Um, so each room had a shared bathroom. So behind each room, there was a bathroom that was connected to two rooms. But there was a bathroom in there, which I thought was really nice. But this is the area... Um, that I waited in until I was wheeled off into the OR. So when the nurse pulled me back to the pre-op room, first of all, she was so nice. Every single person there was so nice and so compassionate. I truly feel like I couldn't have handpicked a better team of people to help me in that situation. Every single person told me that they were so sorry for the reason why I was there and they were so nice and so compassionate. And a lot of the women there shared their stories with me and told me that they had gone through the same thing. And it's amazing how comforting that makes you feel in that time. Um, so that's one thing. If you live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you need a good recommendation for a hospital to go to, send me a message so I can tell you where I went because 
they were wonderful there. So in the pre-op room, you walk in and there's a hospital bed. There's a computer that they do all of their work on. There's a cabinet with various things behind it. There's a chair that my husband got to sit in. There's a television on the wall. Um, and then of course there's the bathroom. So she rifled through the, the closets and got a whole bunch of different supplies for me. A hospital gown that she tied for me. So she pre-tied it for me so I didn't have to worry about messing that part up. Um, a pair of socks that had little grippies on the bottom. They did say they ha that I had to wear those specific socks because you are a fall risk when you have any kind of anesthesia administered to you. Um, I was offered those same socks when I was in labor with my son. I ended up not taking them because I had my own grippy socks, but they did give me them for the surgery specifically. And then she also gave me a pair of mesh panties and a giant pad that brought back many memories of when I delivered my son. It was the same pair of mesh panties, the same pad that they give you right after you deliver. Because I did mention to her, I am currently bleeding. Um, what do I do about that? Because when you wear a hospital gown, you are expected to strip, you know, from head to toe. Um, they tell you not to wear any jewelry while you're there, nothing. So if you show up and you're wearing earrings or rings, you have to take all of that off. So anyways, my husband was able to be in that room with me the whole time. He sat in the chair while she talked to us. She went over a ton of different things, um, you know, why I was here. She asked me a lot of the same questions that the uh, person who called me the day before asked. So a lot of like the general um uh, history questions, family history, medical, you know, things like that. And then she just basically got me comfortable and got me ready in that room. So she stepped out while I got dressed. I was actually able to go in the bathroom and she did say, you know, I recommend you go in the bathroom to get dressed because that room is a revolving door is what she called it. So there was a curtain. Um, it was three solid walls and a curtain in the front but anybody can walk by and open that curtain and also people are in and out of your your pre-op room um, quite frequently whether it be her or the doctor or the anesthesiologist or if it's just somebody who happened to walk by and accidentally pop into your room so she did say you know go ahead and go into the bathroom to get dressed um, put all these on and then put your clothes and your shoes and everything like that in this bag it was a solid pink bag that I then gave to my husband. So I got changed, I went in the bathroom, and she said to leave the bottom of the gown untied. I guess that allows for easy access when they're ready for surgery, I don't know. She said to leave it untied, but drape your drape it on top of yourself underneath the covers. So she was very specific and very focused on the blankets in the room. I don't know why, but I found that really interesting. She focused a lot on the blankets. She was like, do you need more blankets? Do you need warm blankets? And while I was getting dressed, she actually brought in like fresh warm blankets like from a dryer and like put them under my pillow so they stayed warm. And she instructed my husband on how to like drape them over me, which I thought was just so sweet and so caring. Um, so when I got done getting dressed, I walked out of the bathroom, gave my husband the bag filled with my clothes and then... I got in the bed and he draped the blankets over me just like she instructed and then we pulled out the warm blankets from underneath the pillow and they were like steaming like you know when you go and get your nails done and they put like the steaming things on your hands or feet it was like that but it was it was nice um so we put the warm blankets on me and I just kind of got cozy and then a couple minutes later she came back in and she asked me how I was feeling, if I needed any more blankets or pillows or anything like that. And I actually felt pretty fine, very comfortable. I felt very, you know, I didn't feel like I was exposed or that I just, I felt fine. You know, I felt comfortable. I felt like I was talking to my aunt or my sister or something like that. And so she then also gave me um, a specific like reflector blanket that I think is specific for surgeries. Um, it had like a, a gold reflecting side and then a blue side. So she was like, this is the last blanket I'm going to put on you, I promise. But we have to put it on you. And so that was like the top blanket. It was like a plasticky like camping tarp material. And then I had a hat to match. So she was like, well... You don't have to wear your hat right now, but you will have to wear your hat eventually. So she just kind of put it like up on my pillow so it was easily accessible. So after that, um, she did give me a couple of oral medications. It was an antibiotic and some stre extra strength Tylenol um, to kind of get me ready for the surgery. And then she started my IV. Now I will say the IV portion of it 
was probably the most painful portion of the entire DNC process from start to finish physically. And that's because for one, I'm pretty scared of needles to begin with. But for two, it's an IV. You know, I remember when I delivered my son, um, that was one of the first times I had ever gotten an IV before. And that was pretty painful for me then. This time it was even more painful for me, but I think it's because I was just anticipating it in my mind. So she said that she was gonna try to put it as far down as possible without having to put it in my hand. I know when I had my IV with my son, when I delivered him, I had it in my arm up here. My sister is a labor and delivery nurse and she said she tries to avoid like the bend of your arm as much as possible and hands because they're painful. So when I delivered my son, I was happy that I got the IV here. She was looking at my veins and she tried, she didn't poke me, but she tried, you know, like kind of smacking my arm a little bit here and here. And she was slowly going down farther and farther. And then she ended up at my hand and she was like, well, honey, I'm really sorry, but I think I'm gonna have to put it in your hand. And I was like, that's fine. So she kind of like smacked my hand a few times. <laughs> I don't know if that was like to get the blood flowing or to make it warm or whatever, but my hand was really dry because I wasn't allowed to wear lotion. And so anyway, so she smacked my hand a few times, wiped it down, and then I looked away because I, I can't watch them do IVs. I just can't. And uh, she only had to poke me once. I actually still have the mark on my hand right here from where the IV was. And it burned, you guys. It burned. I do not remember my IV from my son burning. This one burned. And she said that it was something to do with the cleaner. Um... I don't know what that means. And then the fact that my hand was dry. And so she was like, it's gonna go away eventually. I promise it'll go away. And I, it burned for a good like 20 minutes. Um, but she said that that was totally normal. In my mind, of course, I just kept thinking like, something is wrong, the IV is not placed correctly. But she kept reassuring me, no, it's a good IV. It's placed in the right spot. The burning will go away. Um, and then she kept asking me, how's the burning, how's the burning? Eventually it went away, but I did notice that my hand was just kind of sore. Um, I definitely was very aware of the IV. I knew it was there, but it wasn't burning anymore. After that, she did let me know what to expect from that point forward. Um, so she reassured me over and over again. She was like, you're going to be fine. Everyone here is great. She told me about her experience with being put under anesthesia. Um, and then she started the IV drip. So it was just saline I'm guessing but they do want to hydrate you I think it's like 30 minutes to an hour before your surgery since you do have to go so long without eating and drinking they want to get your body hydrated and prepped for surgery so I was just on like a saline drip for from that moment forward through the end of my DNC then after that she was like okay you know you got about an hour before the doctor is ready to see you and I was nervous at this point and I was sad I was emotional I was nervous I was scared and she was like do you want me to have the anesthesiologist come in and give you some medicine to calm you uh, because they can do that they can give you either oral medicine or stuff in your IV to just calm you she called it the I don't care medicine <laughs> and you know, thinking back, I probably should have taken it at that point because I'm sure my blood pressure was just through the roof because I was so nervous about what was going on. But I told her that I really wanted to talk to the doctor first because this, like I said before, was a different doctor. This was a doctor that I hadn't met before. I had never seen her before. I just wanted that, that interaction of like, hi, I'm Melissa, please take care of me, and then to confirm the genetic testing portion of the DNC. So I can't recall if I mentioned this earlier in my video or not, but when you have a DNC or a, you know, a miscarriage in general, one of the options you might be given is to genetically test your baby um, or you know the, the tissue inside of your uterus for things like um, chromosomal abnormalities, just genetic pathology and things like that. So that is something that my husband and I wanted to do. And so I wanted to confirm with her that that was in the notes and all of that. And I, I just wanted to meet her and I wanted to remember meeting her. Um, my nurse did say that once you have the I don't care medicine, your mind gets a little foggy and you forget things a lot. And so she was like, well, if you want to meet her, then maybe you shouldn't take that medicine. So I didn't. Um, she did say turn on the TV, do whatever you need, play with your phone, do whatever you need to keep yourself occupied in this hour because it's going to be about an hour. So I actually didn't turn the TV on the entire time. It's kind of a weird thing when I'm like nervous. I just sit there. 
I sit there with my thoughts. I don't watch TV. I don't look at my phone. I don't talk to people. I just sit there with my, with my thoughts. So my husband and I kind of sat there in silence for a good 30, 40 minutes. Um, throughout this process, I did have to go to the bathroom a couple of times, and I think it's because of the IV drip. So that was a big process because I was hooked up to an IV and underneath of tons of blankets. So it was like this big process of pulling blankets off of me, unhooking the IV, carrying the IV bag into the bathroom with me, hanging it up in the bathroom going to the bathroom <laughs> I had the big mesh panties and the big pad on and so it was just kind of a process to go to the bathroom but um after the second time I went to the bathroom the anesthesiologist came into the room and that was really nice I got to meet her face to face she asked me a whole bunch of questions she looked inside of my mouth to see if I had loose teeth or anything like that I found out later the reason why they do that is because they do put a breathing tube in your throat when you get general anesthesia and that could cause, you know, if they smack one of your teeth or something like that. So that's what she was looking at was to make sure I had a good throat and mouth for that. But you know, she reassured me they were going to take care of me, everything was going to be fine, she was going to be there the whole time. And then after she left, it was probably another 15 minutes, I did go to the bathroom again in that time frame. While I was in the bathroom, during that time frame, um, the doctor came in the room and I could hear her. I was in the bathroom, but I could hear her. And she goes, is she in the bathroom? And my husband goes, yeah, she's in the bathroom. And so she actually stayed in the room while I finished up going to the bathroom, charting on the computer, doing whatever she needed to do. And then as soon as I walked in, she was so kind and so nice. And it's weird because I, I know it's COVID season, but I just had this urge to hug her. And I kind of like reached in for a hug and then I pulled myself back and like shook her hand. But even that, I was like, is this, should I be doing this? Like this is COVID, it's weird. Um, but I just had this like maternal, like, just like, please take care of me moment. You know what I mean? And so she was like, hi, I'm, you know, your doctor's partner. Um, I'm going to take care of you today. And she stayed in that room, that pre-op room with me until I felt better. Um, I started crying when she was in there. I told her that I was really scared and that I was really sad. And she stayed there with me until I calmed down and felt better. And she made sure I had no questions. She reassured me, you know, that she had done this several times before. This was not her first rodeo. That was her exact quote. And that she was very confident that they were going to take care of me. She did inform me that this would be an ultrasound guided DNC, which is different from a typical DNC. It kind of blows my mind that ultrasound guided is not standard practice. You would think that every single DNC would be ultrasound guided, which is exactly what it, what it sounds like. They have an ultrasound machine there with an ultrasound tech that has the wand on your belly and your uterus the whole time. And they do that to make sure they can get all of the fetal tissue out and they don't leave anything behind. She said that they typically do that when your gestation is a little bit uh, older or, or farther along. I was 12 weeks and the fact that it was twins, um, they wanted to make sure that they got everything. So it was ultrasound guided. And she just reassured me that everything was going to be okay. So after she left, the nurse came back in or she might've actually came in at the same time the doctor was in the room. And I said, I'm ready for the, I don't care medicine, give it to me now. I met the doctor, I did what I needed to do. And so immediately after that, the anesthesiologist came back in and had like a couple of syringes in their pocket. <laughs> and they were like, okay, are you ready for the good stuff? And I was like, yep, I'm ready for the good stuff. But I was also super nervous and super just like, scared you know I, I felt comfortable and I felt taken care of but I was about to go into surgery you know and so I was still really nervous but probably like 10 seconds <laughs> after they injected that into my IV I started to feel I guess the best way to explain it is drunk I felt drunk I felt like I had had you know five glasses of wine and I was just like you know, we're good, but I was still alert. I know a lot of people say they forget what happens after that point, but I was still very awake, very alert, very aware of what was going on around me. The doctor, the anesthesiologist, and then there was a, a general anesthesiologist, I think is how he introduced himself, um, basically worked hand in hand with the anesthesiologist. Uh, all three of them 
got my bed and started to wheel me out. I got to say goodbye to my husband. He took all of my belongings and everything with him. Um, and I think he was instructed to wait in some waiting room. I have no idea which waiting room he had to wait in. There was three of them that we saw. And the doctor said, I'll come and get you when we're ready. It'll be about an hour. And so all three of them, they took my bed and they wheeled me down the hallway into the OR. And again, I had the, the I don't care medicine going, so I didn't care what was going on, but I was still aware. We walked decently far. Um, I cannot recall if we got into an elevator or not, but I remember very clearly being rolled into the OR. And in the OR, there was several people in there waiting for all all four of us. Um, so with myself, the two anesthesiologists, and the doctor. So there was a nurse in there. There was an the ultrasound tech in there. There was a couple of other people, and I I, I wasn't really aware of why everybody was in there but there was a lot of people in there and I do also remember that I had to switch beds so they had like the operating bed and then the, the bed that I was in from the pre-op room so I did have to like lift my butt up and scoot over to the operating bed um, I imagine if you were so loopy they'd have to lift you and do it yourself but I was alert enough to where I could do it myself so I lifted my butt up, scooted over to the operating bed, they put blankets on top of me again so I never felt exposed or anything like that. Um, and then probably a minute after that, um, the anesthesiologist said, okay, we're gonna get started. We're gonna inject something in your IV. It's gonna be a little cold. So I was like, okay. And I felt that go in and then she put the mask on my face. So she said, this is just oxygen, just take a deep breath. So I did. And then she said, I'm gonna walk you through everything. I'm gonna tell you what's going on, no surprises. So she was like, this is just oxygen. And then the second deep breath, she said, okay, now we're gonna give you the anesthesia. So go ahead and take a deep breath in. And I remember like I had the mask on, I looked up and then I fell asleep. And I don't remember a single thing that happened while I was asleep, thank God for that. I felt no pain, I felt, you know, nothing and then what seemed like a second later, I opened my eyes and I was still in the same OR with all the same people around me. I do recall somebody making a comment of, oh, that was fast. <laughs> I guess they didn't expect me to wake up that fast, um, but it was good that I woke up that fast. But someone said like, oh, that was fast. And I remember I saw the doctor's face and they said, okay, we're done. And for some reason, I was dreaming about shopping and, and Pottery Barn, and I said something to them about shopping and Pottery Barn and, and Easter baskets, and they were like, yeah, shopping, you know, kind of humoring me a little bit. And then very shortly after that, I don't remember if they moved me to another bed or if I was already in another bed. I don't, I don't know the bed situation, um, if I was in the OR bed or... But I got wheeled out of the OR and I was put in a recovery area. So that recovery area was a big open room with lots of people in it, probably like 20 different patients, just bed next to bed next to bed with maybe two or three feet in between each bed. And there was like a nurse or two, you know, per person or per row or things like that kind of running around. And so... Um, I was kind of put into position and I remember I remember there was somebody on this side of me the left the right side of me But I remember looking at the lady on the right side of me um, And she I don't know why she was there. You know people are there for various reasons um, Not everybody there is getting a DNC everybody there is for a different reason. So I remember she was still very out of it <laughs> Very out of it like sleeping out of it and I was thinking to myself like why is she but I guess, you know, people don't always wake up from anesthesia as quickly as I do, so they get wheeled into this post-op area um, while they're recovering from the anesthesia. Anyways, I had a different nurse in that area, so not the same nurse I had in pre-op, and she kept asking me, how are you feeling? What is your pain level? And my throat hurt so bad. I think of anything that had happened throughout the entire DNC, my throat hurt more than anything else, and that was because of the breathing tube. So because I was put under general anesthesia, um, I did have a breathing tube in, and my throat was killing me. So I kept saying, my throat hurts, my throat hurts. I couldn't really talk, I had a very raspy voice. I almost lost my voice. And she was like, that's totally normal. How does everything else feel? And I was like, it hurts like I, I remember thinking like it hurts like this feels like very bad menstrual cramps and so she was like okay I'm gonna give you a little bit more medicine um, and I can't remember if it was liquid 
or pills. I don't remember. I don't remember. She gave me some kind of medicine and she was like, this medicine's going to make you kind of sleepy. It's okay if you fall asleep. Um, so I remember I took the medicine and I closed my eyes for like a couple of minutes. Like I didn't fall asleep. I still remember hearing everything around me. Um, and then she came back to me and she was like, how are you feeling now? And I was like, I'm feeling fine. And she was like, okay, we're going to go ahead and take you to your recovery room where your husband is going to be. I don't know what the protocol is, but I think they just want to make sure you're awake and you're aware and you're not throwing up or any, having any adverse reactions to the anesthesia before they take you to the room. So I was only in that like giant post-op area for maybe 30 minutes. Um, if that and then they wheeled me to a more private room where my husband was there. He was waiting, he was there. That room, just like the pre-op room, had three walls and a curtain and a private bathroom um, instead of a shared bathroom. So I got wheeled into there, I got yet another nurse. <laughs> it's crazy how many people I was handed off to. But I got yet another nurse who, again, kept asking me, how are you feeling? Um, she asked me if I was hungry or thirsty and I was like, yes, I'm dying of thirst. Please bring me water. So she brought me water and ice and she's the one who helped me get dressed. She took my IV out of my hand. Um, I was able to stay in the bed. There was a chair in there as well if I wanted to sit in a chair versus the bed. But she said we need to make sure that you can go to the bathroom okay and once you do that, then you're free to go. So... Um, I remember sitting up in the bed, and because I was under general anesthesia, I was still a little loopy, a little wobbly, um, so she helped me sit up, and then she walked me to the bathroom, because I had to go right away. I didn't have to wait. I told her, like, right when she was in there, I was like, I have to go right now. She was like, oh, okay, well, let me go get your water for you and get out all your stuff, and I was like, okay, but I gotta go right now. <laughs> so probably, you know, that room I was in for a total of maybe 10, 15 minutes as well, so I didn't sit in any room for much long much longer than that, um, except for the pre-op room. But anyways, um, so she walked me, I think she took the uh, IV out of my hand first. I'm pretty sure she did. And then we walked over to the bathroom and she sat in there with me, like she didn't leave me alone. It reminded me a lot of when I had to take my first urination after I delivered my son, where the nurse was like in there with me and she wouldn't leave. <laughs> I think they wanna make sure you don't like topple off of the toilet or whatever. So, um, anyways, she, like, walked me over to the toilet, sat me on the toilet, and then she kind of stood back a little bit, but she stayed in there while I went to the bathroom. And then, after I went to the bathroom, she kind of, like, walked out of the room to grab my clothes for a split second and brought them back in. She put my underwear on for me, and she also put the pad in my underwear for me. She was very, very nice. I did not feel weird having any of this done, by the way. I was very comforted. It was, like, a comfort, like, nice feeling. So she put the pad in my underwear for me, she put my underwear on, she put my pants on for me, she put my socks on for me. Um, she let me put my top and my shirt on myself, um, but she put my pants on, probably because I was sitting on the toilet and it was just easy. I don't know, I don't know why she did it, but she did. Um, so then we walked back over to the bed, I put my bra on, I put my shirt on, I, my husband helped me put my shoes on, and she was like, okay, you're good to go. And so... At that point, um, I had to wait for somebody to wheelchair me out of the hospital. They said this is pretty standard for all procedures. I remember I had to be wheelchaired out when I had my son, so it makes sense. So we had to wait for the wheelchair guy, but um, that was maybe another couple of minutes or so. He came around with the wheelchair, I sat in the wheelchair, and my husband walked next to us. We all walked together out to the parking garage. Um, my husband went and got the car, pulled around, the wheelchair guy sat with me while we waited for my husband. I remember asking him, like, is this what you do all day? He was like, yeah. I was like, you must get a lot of steps in. And he was like, yeah. And he, like, <laughs> he, like, showed me his, like, Fitbit app or something. And I don't remember what it was, but he had, like, a lot of steps every day, like, 18,000 steps every single day. So I thought that was pretty funny, but... Anyways, I stood up out of the wheelchair myself, walked into the car, my husband helped me sit down, and, uh, and that was the end of it. Um, my doctor prescribed me ibuprofen and hydrocodone, um, and she kind of instructed me when I could start to take each of those because they did give me a lot of medicine in the hospital, so they didn't want me to like double take any of the medicine. 
or take anything too soon. My husband brought me home right away. My mom was here. My in-laws were here. So I just went straight up and then laid in my bed and my husband went and got my medicine from the pharmacy. And uh, as far as like my actual recovery goes, it truly was not that bad. Um, I didn't experience any kind of excruciating pain. I had cramping. I did keep myself on a constant flow of the ibuprofen for the first 48 hours. I just constantly, you know, every six hours or so I took ibuprofen just to make sure. But after that, I, I only took it as needed. I never ended up having to take the hydrocodone. It never got that bad. And then as far as the bleeding goes and spotting goes, um, just a little bit of spotting here and there. I did have what I would consider moderate bleeding on day two. And then as of today, I'm about two weeks post-op and I'm still experiencing very, very slight spotting, but no cramping, nothing like that. I did get a call from my doctor the following day to ask me how I was doing and all of that. And I remember telling her like, my throat hurts. <laughs> because that was the one thing that hurt the most for me. Um, I, like I said, I almost lost my voice. It was really hard for me to talk the first couple of days. It took about three or four days for my voice to fully come back to normal, which was odd, I thought. Um, but other than that, the, the physical recovery from the DNC truly uh, was not bad at all. I will also mention that, and this completely depends on your doctor and, you know, the, the, the company that you're doctor works under but we have an online portal where they load um, doctor's visits uh, you can make appointments there, test results you can message your doctor if you have questions things like that so i was able to go on that portal the next day and read very detailed notes of what happened during my dnc um, the doctor she left very detailed like a like a summary of what happened while I was under anesthesia. Um, she did that and the anesthesiologist also did that same thing. So they listed out all of the medication that they gave me. And then, you know, the paragraph or two that my doctor left behind was very, very detailed. It did say, you know, what happened from the moment I went out of uh, under anesthesia to the moment I woke up. And she listed things like how large my uterus was, how, how big the babies were. Um, how much she had to dilate me, um, how quickly the whole process took, and it, I think it read like 20 minutes or 30 minutes or something like that. Like it doesn't take very long to do a DNC, which is great. She recorded exactly when they did the ultrasound, how large my uterus was before, how large my uterus was after, um, what the, the tissue looked like when it came out, um, that she sent it off to pathology, um, how long it took me to become alert after they pulled the breathing tube out and stop stop the anesthesia I mean the very detailed of what happened, which is really nice um, I know some people are probably like ignorance is bliss I don't want to know what happens, but I Found comfort in reading through that and knowing what happened because like I said, I don't remember it was like out and then I woke up <laughs> and so it's just kind of kind of nice to um, to read that so I don't know if your doctor or hospital will do that But it's just something maybe if you do have an online portal to, to check to see um, because it was really interesting to read as far as the emotional or mental recovery goes um, I do think that the DNC Provided me closure on that part of my miscarriage. I think if I were to have let the baby pass naturally or even with the medicine, um, I feel like it would have been longer, it would have been harder, and I just wanted, I just wanted that part to be over with. Um, so it did provide me immediate medical closure uh, of that part of the miscarriage. And so after that, I was able to really focus on um, you know, the emotional and the mental side of things. I was able to pay attention to my son, you know, spend time cuddling him and loving on him and, and spend time with my mom and, and really just care for myself. The one thing I, I'm really bummed I wasn't able to do is take a bath. <laughs> they do instruct you after a DNC, you cannot take a bath for two weeks. 
You can't have sex for two weeks, um, go swimming for two weeks. You can take a shower, but you can't, you know, submerge your body in water. So one of the things I like to do for self-care is take baths, and it's cold outside right now, so a bath sounds so wonderful, but I wasn't able to take a bath. Um, but other than that, um, I do think it, it did help provide some closure for me. The entire process truly was not that bad as far as, you know, the physical side of things. So God forbid if I ever have to go through this again, I will go do the DNC because it truly, truly was not bad. If you're trying to weigh the options, I know everybody's experience is different. Um, as far as what happens afterwards, it's different for everybody. Some people cramp really bad, some people bleed really bad. I didn't have that experience. Anyways, I hope that this video was helpful. I'm sure I have like an hour and a half of footage I have to figure out how to edit down. But I hope that this was helpful for you. Like I said, this was hard for me to find, so I just thought I'd go ahead and make it myself and, and put it on the internet so you guys could have the information. But um, yeah, I hope that you guys enjoyed watching and you found this video helpful. Other than that, if you have any questions, leave them down below or send me a message on Instagram and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.